All right, what's up, people? So I've been doing some research, and apparently people think that the Bible was a plagiarization. Is that a word? Plagiarization? Plagiarized? It was a plagiarized story, which w was based off of the Epic of Gilgamesh. So I did some research, looked up the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I'm going to read you all a story. Not the entire thing, obviously, but... I'm going to read a summary to you guys from Sparknotes. If you really don't want to listen to me, go ahead, close the video, dislike, and go uh, read the summary yourself. Oh, oopsie. This is a weird camera. I can do all kinds of crazy things. I can, like, change the lighting, for example. Uh, anyways, so yeah, if you don't want to listen to me, go ahead and go read that, but in the meantime, it... If by some ungodly chance you like listening to me, then go ahead and have a seat, get some hot cocoa, get your slippers on, because I'm going to read you the epic of Gilgamesh. Alright, let's get my, my reading glasses. These actually aren't even reading glasses, these are actually far away, because I'm actually nearsighted. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not even going to wear those. I, I just thought it'd be funny. I'm such a loser. <laughs> All right, guys, let's let's read the Epic of Gilgamesh and see how it compares to the Bible. <laughs> All right, the Epic's prelude offers a general introduction to Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, who was two thirds god and one third man. All right, that makes sense. Kind of, kind of relates to the Bible. He built a magnificent ziggurats, or temple towers, surrounded his city with high walls, and laid out his or orchids and fields. Or is that orchard? Orchards, my bad. And fields. He was physically beautiful, immensely strong, and very wise. Although Gilgamesh was godlike in body and mind, he began his kingship as a cruel despo. despot. He lorded over his subjects, raping any woman who struck his fancy, whether she was the wife of one of his warriors or the daughter of a nobleman. Yeah, Jesus did that. He accomplished his building projects with forced labor, and his exhausted subjects gro groaned under his oppression. Sounds like Jesus. The gods heard his subjects' pleas and decided to keep Gilgamesh in check by creating a wild man named Enkidu, who was as, magni as magnificent as Gilgamesh. Enkidu became Gilgamesh's great friend, and Gilgamesh's heart was shattered when Enkidu died of an illness inflicted by the gods. Gilgamesh then traveled to the edge of the world and learned about the days before the de deluge and other secrets of the gods, and he recorded them on stone tablets. What? That doesn't... Okay, where in the Bible does anything sound like that? Okay, okay, whatever. The epic begins with Enkidu. He lives with the animals, suckling at their breasts, grazing in the meadows, and drinking at their watering places. A hunter discovers him and sends a temple prostitute into the wilderness to tame him. In that time, people considered women and sex calming forces that could domesticate wild men like Enkidu and bring them into the civilized world. When Enkidu sleeps with the woman, the animals reject him since he is no longer one of them. Now he is part of the human world. Then the harlot teaches him everything he needs to know to be a man. Enkidu is outraged by what he hears about Gilgamesh's excesses, so he travels to Uruk to challenge him. When he arrives, Gilgamesh is about to force his way into a bride's wedding chamber. Enkidu steps into the doorway and blocks his passage. The two men wrestle fiercely for a long time, and Gilgamesh finally prevails. After that, they become friends and set about looking for an adventure to share. Okay, that... What... Um, sounds like Jesus to me. I don't even... Okay. Gilgamesh and Enkidu decide to steal trees from a distant cedar forest forbidden to mortals. A terrifying demon named Humbaba, the devoted servant of Enlil, the god of earth, wind, and air, guards it. The two heroes make the perilous journey to the forest and standing side by side fight with the monster. The assistance from Shamash, the sun god, they kill him. Then they cut down the forbidden trees fashion the tallest into an enormous gate, make the rest into a raft, and float on it back to Uruk. Upon their return, Ishtar, the goddess of love, is overcome with lust for Gilgamesh. Ooh, this is getting spicy. Gilgamesh spurns her. Spurn? What is, is that good or bad? What does spurn mean? Oh, I suck. 
Uh, I'll, I'll look it up right now. Okay, dictionary.reference.com. And let's type in spurn. Not spoin, that's typo. Spurn. To reject with disdain, scorn. Ah, oh, dude. Poor Ishtar. Ah, oh, poor girl. Okay. Enraged, the goddess asks her father, Anu, the god of the sky, to send the bull of heaven to punish him. The bull comes down from the sky, bringing with him seven years of famine. Okay, that kind of sounds biblical, I guess. But not in bull form. That, that's just weird. Gilgamesh and Enkidu wrestle with the bull and kill it. The gods meet in council and agree that one of the two friends must be punished for their transgression, and they decide Enkidu is going to die. He takes ill, suffers immensely, and shares his visions of the underworld with Gilgamesh. When he finally dies, Gilgamesh is heartbroken. Gilgamesh can't stop grieving for Enkidu, uh, and he can't and, and he can't stop brooding about the prospect of his own death. Exchanging his kingly garments for animal skins as a way of mourning Enkidu, he sets off into the wilderness, determined to find it. Napished him, the Mesopotamian Noah. All right. After the flood, the gods had granted it. Napished him eternal life, and the Gilgamesh. How is that the Mesopotamian Noah if that? That didn't happen to Noah. Noah was a drunkard and he died. And Gilgamesh hopes that At Nippish. Okay, I, I can't even like read that name. At Nap. Okay, we'll just call him At Nip. Can Catnip? Okay, we'll, we'll call him Catnip. Can tell him how he might avoid death too. Gilgamesh's journey takes him to the twin peaked mountain called Mashu, where the sun sets into one side of the mountain at night and rises out of the other side in the morning. Catnip lives beyond the mountain, but the two scorpion monsters that guard its entrance refuse to allow Gilgamesh into the tunnel that passes through it. Gilgamesh pleads with them, and they relent. I'm laughing because that's nowhere, like, in the Bible. What is this nonsense? I mean, I love Greek mythology, but to, to read this and to try to fit it with, with the Bible, I, I can't even take this seriously. <laughs> Gosh. Two scorpion monsters? I don't... Oh my gosh. After a harrowing passage through total darkness, ooh, Gilgamesh emerges into a beautiful garden by the sea where he meets Siduri, a veiled tavern keeper, and tells her about his quest. She warns him that seeking, that seeking immortality is futile and that he should be satisfied with the pleasures of this world. Yeah, that is the opposite. That is the exact opposite of everything that the Bible stands for. However, when she can't turn him away from his purpose, she directs him to Urshanabi, the ferryman. Again with these Ursha names. Urshanabi takes Gilgamesh on the boat journey across the sea and through the waters of death to Catnip. Catnip tells Gilgamesh the story of the flood, how the gods met in council and decided to destroy humankind. Okay, first of all, it was one god, and I guess that's the best way you can compare, but... First of all, Noah did not get eternal life. Uh, okay, uh, Ea, the god of wisdom, warned Catnip about the god's plan and told him how to fashion a gigantic boat in which his family and the seed of every living creature might escape. Okay, first of all, it wasn't a trick. Okay, uh, second of all. Second of all, it wasn't a trick or a chance to escape. God specifically said, Noah, these guys suck, so I'm going to kill all of them. And you are going to be the hero of this little story. When, and then when the waters finally receded, the gods regretted what they'd done. God didn't regret it. Uh, and agreed that, that they would never try to destroy humankind again. God did not say that specifically. Because I remember I was reading Genesis and he said he would never destroy them with a flood. And if I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But to my knowledge, he said I would not use a flood. At Nippish Tim, oh, Catnip was rewarded with eternal life. Men would die, but humankind would continue. That's how it was in the very beginning of the Bible, not after the flood. When Gilgamesh insists that he would be allowed to live forever, Catnip gives him a test. If you think you can stay alive for eternity, he says, surely you can stay awake for a week. Gilgamesh tries and immediately fails, so Catnip orders him to clean himself up put on his real garments again, and return to Yurik where he belongs. Just as Gilgamesh is departing, however, Catnip's wife convinces him 
to tell Gilgamesh about a miraculous plant that restores youth. That's in the Bible. Gilgamesh finds the plant and takes it with him, planning to share it with the elders of Uruk. But a snake steals the plant one night while they are camping. As the serpent slithers away, it sheds its skin and becomes young again. I see the correlation. Blah. But, first of all, the snake was before the flood. Uh, the snake did not steal a fruit. The snake deceived Eve. And, okay, first of all, okay, uh, um, th th literally the only thing that, th that, that these two little parts of the stories have in common is a flood, a fruit, and a snake. That is literally all I see in common. When Gilgamesh returns to Yurik, he is empty-handed but, re re but reconciled at last to his mortality. He knows that he can't live forever, but that humankind will. wrong -roo. Well, actually, yeah, actually, yeah, humankind as a whole, we're, we're going to die off eventually, and God's, God's getting ready for it. Now he sees that the city he had uh, repudiated in his grief and terror is a magnificent, enduring achievement. The closest thing to immortality to which a mortal can aspire. Alright, so I guess... I'm assuming Gilgamesh is supposed to be Jesus. What? I don't... Okay, um... That's just like saying the story of Jack and Jill is the exact same as Hansel and Gretel. Because there were... There was a boy and a girl, and they both went up into a mysterious place and you know someone tried to kill them i don't know the hill was evil i don't know whoever decided that the bible was the same as the epic of gilgamesh it's freaking stupid that's all i got to say um obviously every single atheist under the under the sun is going to tell me i'm wrong and that they're the exact same and they're going to go on this 25 paragraph comment <laughs> That I'm not even going to read. G guys, stop doing that. You think I care, but I don't. <laughs> Alright, I hope you guys have enjoyed this little story time with Justin. Oh, I'll see you guys next time. Woo! That was fun. That was fun.